Fundamental problem F14 says, determine the resultant internal normal force, shear force, and bending moment at point C in the beam. So the normal force here we'll call N, the shearing force V, and the bending moment M. And now looking at the diagram, point C is our point of interest, which is the center of the beam. And now, of course, the first step is to draw a free body diagram of the system. So here we have the beam along with points A and B. And of course, we need to add in all the acting forces on the beam. So we see that at point A on the left here, we have a roller, which only carries a vertical reaction force, which we can call AY. Then at point B on the right, we have a pin support. And I'll go ahead and call that vertical reaction force BY. And we know that pin supports carry both a vertical and horizontal reaction forces. But here, since there is no applied force in the X direction, with the only applied force acting in the vertical Y direction, there is essentially no reaction force in the horizontal X direction. And now we can draw in the distributed load along with point C which is made up of a rectangular section and a triangular section, which all carries 10 kilonewtons per meter. And now, of course, we add in our dimensions, which are 3 meters and 3 meters, just like so. And lastly, we need our coordinate system, which I will use x, y, and z, where the z-axis will be used for the moments. And now again, we have a distributed load of 10 kilonewtons per meter that we need to take care of. And so since this distributed load is made up of two different geometries, initially we can start off by focusing on the left side, which is the rectangular section, ignoring the right side that is triangular. So on the left side, we know that the distributed load will have a resultant force, which we can call FR1. And due to the rectangular geometry of the distributed load, FR1 will act at the center of the rectangle. So it'll be 1.5 meters from the left and 1.5 meters from the right, just like this. So now we can go ahead and find FR1, which is essentially equivalent to the area of the rectangle. And so we know that area of a rectangle is equal to base times height, where in this case, our base is the length of the rectangle, which is 3 meters. And the height is essentially the distributed load, which is 10 kilonewtons per meter. And of course, all of this is from statics. So plugging in these numbers, we have 3 meters times 10 kilonewtons per meter, which in this case will be equal to 30 kilonewtons. As you can see, the meters canceling out leaving us in units of force, which we expect. So FR1 is simply equal to 30 kilonewtons. And now we need to solve for the resultant force on the remaining side of the distributed load, which is the right side that is triangular. And here we can call this resultant force FR2. And we know that's from statics, resultant forces from triangular distributed loads act a third away from the tallest point of the triangle, which in this case is the left side. So hence, a third of three meters is of course one meter. So there's gonna be one meter and then two meters on the right, just like so. So now in this case, the resultant force FR2 is essentially equivalent to the area of the triangle, which we know is one half base times height. And here, our base is the length of the triangle, which is 3 meters. And the height, again, is equivalent to 10 kilonewtons per meter. So plugging this in, we have 1 half times 3 meters times 10 kilonewtons per meter, which leaves us with 15 kilonewtons. So hence, FR2 is 15 kilonewtons. So now that we have broken down the distributed load, into the resultant forces, we need to find the reaction forces in order to solve for the internal forces. So here we need to determine AY and BY. 
And of course, in order to do this, we need to apply global equilibrium, that is for the entire system. So now first, let's try to find AY. So now let me just get rid of these scribbles here. Now we see that we have two unknown forces in the Y direction. So we can't use sum of forces in the Y direction to find AY. So in this case, we'll have to use sum of moments. And here, if we want to find AY, we're going to have to take our moments at the other unknown point, which is B. So we'll have sum of moments at B around which axis? The Z axis, where we can assume counterclockwise as positive. But remember, you can choose your own direction as positive. You'll still end up with the same answer. And so we set these sum of moments equal to zero to solve for AY under equilibrium. So starting off from point B, we go to our next force, which is F2, and that creates a counterclockwise moment. So it's positive using the right hand rule. And of course, remember that moment is equal to force times distance. So in this case, the force is F2, which is 15 kilonewtons. And the distance between F2 and B is the two meters. So this moment will be equal to 15 kilonewtons times two meters. And now moving on to the next force, which is FR1. From point B to FR1, we have yet another counterclockwise moment. So this will be plus 30 kilonewtons times the distance between B and FR1, which in this case is 1.5 plus 1 plus 2, which is 4.5 meters. And now going from B to the remaining force, which is AY, we will have a clockwise moment, which is negative so this is going to be minus AY times the distance from B to A, which is 6 meters. And so that completes our sum of moments. And we can now go ahead and reduce this equation and solve for AY. So moving AY to the left side, we have AY times 6 meters equals 30 kilonewton meters plus 135 kilonewton meters. So here we can simply add the 30 kilonewton meters and the 135 kilonewton meters together, which will give us 165 kilonewton meters. And solving for AY, we can just divide the six meters to the right side. And here the meters cancel out. So of course we are left with kilonewtons. So AY is equal to 27.5 kilonewtons, which I'll go ahead and add to the free body diagram. And now since we are asked to determine the internal loadings of the system at point C, we can go ahead and just leave out BY and use AY, choosing to analyze the left side of the beam. But for the purpose of this video, I will go ahead and also find BY. So BY can simply be found by summing up the forces in the Y direction and setting them equal to zero. So starting off on the left here with AY, assuming up as positive, we have 27.5 kilonewtons and then minus the 30 kilonewtons from FR1, then minus 15 kilonewtons from FR2, and then lastly plus BY. So simply summing up the forces and solving for BY, we have BY is equal to 17.5 kilonewtons. And now we have found all the forces acting on the beam. So in that case, we can now finally move on to solving for the internal loadings. And again, our point of interest is point C, which is the center of the beam. And so in that case, in order to find the internal loads, we need to make a cut perpendicular to the beam. And that'll be at point C, just like so. And now we can choose to analyze either side of C. So either the left side or the right side. In this case, I will go ahead and analyze the left side, 
which I'll also go ahead and mark on the diagram that we're given. And so now the next step is to draw a free body diagram of this left side that includes the cut section along with all the corresponding forces. So here to the right is our cut alpha at point C and then on the left end is point A along with the reaction force of 27.5 kilonewtons and the distance between A and C is 3 meters. And then, of course, we have FR1, which is 30 kilonewtons. And now on the right side, where the cut is, we have our internal normal force, which points to the right. We can call that NC. And then our shear force, VC, which runs vertically downwards. And lastly, we have our bending moment, MC, which goes in the counterclockwise direction. And this is according to the Hibbler book sign convention. So now starting off with our normal force NC. Here we set the sum of forces in the X direction equal to zero to solve for the normal force. And so of course we see there is no applied force in the X direction. So the only force here is NC, which means that NC equals zero. Now moving on to the shear force VC, here we need to use the sum of forces in the y direction equal to 0 to find VC. So that is equal to 27.5 kilonewtons minus the 30 kilonewtons and then minus VC. So solving for VC we end up getting negative 2.5 kilonewtons. So that is the shear force at point C. And lastly, to find our bending moment, we use our moment balance, and that'll be the summation of moments at point C, of course, around the z-axis. And here again, assuming counterclockwise as positive. So setting this equal to zero. So from point C, going to our next force, which is the 30 kilonewtons, we get a positive counterclockwise moment at a distance of 1.5 meters. Actually, before that, let's go ahead and just add the bending moment MC onto the equation. So we have MC plus the moment we found, which is 30 kilonewtons times 1.5 meters. And next is the moment from C to point A, which will be clockwise in direction so it's minus 27.5 kilonewtons times 3 meters. So solving for MC, we will get MC equals 37.5 kilonewton meters. And so that right there is the bending moment at C.